Get ready to learn a lesson from McGuire, Griffey, Ripken, and more. Major League Baseball is proud to introduce Hitters on Hitting, Finding the Sweet Spot. Some of baseball's all-time heaviest hitters reveal the inside secrets of their swing with exclusive interviews and footage not available anywhere else. The interactive DVD includes over 50 minutes of bonus material that USA Today calls pure perfection. Hitters on Hitting is available now wherever videos and DVDs are sold. The Bay Bridge, the main link between San Francisco and Oakland, emerged as the symbol of the 1989 World Series. For here were the two best teams in baseball playing for the ultimate prize. And the difference between home and away was nothing more than a toll. An unparalleled sense of pride swept the Bay Area as the World Series got underway. Newspapers were filled with accounts of goodwill by the fans and the charm of the cities. Regardless of the final outcome, it was clear that everyone was going to win. Then came the 15 seconds that sent both the symbol of the series and the pride it generated crashing down. 15 terrorizing seconds that transformed baseball players and fans into anxious husbands and wives, mothers and fathers. The fact that millions of viewers first got word of the earthquake while settling down to watch the third game of the World Series only amplified the awkward collision of baseball at its best and Mother Nature at her worst. In the days that followed, folks who had come together as baseball fans came together once again for a different cause. Heroes emerged. Compassion, generosity, and sacrifice replaced home runs and shutouts. In time, baseball resumed, in part as a South, to help heal the wounds. In retrospect, it is not the games that will be remembered, but the special place and time in which those games took place. The 1989 World Series, the Battle of the Bay. The Oakland A's repeated as division champions in 1989, but it wasn't easy, as the Bash Brothers of 88 looked more like a mash unit in 89. Jose Canseco, was one of several key performers on the shelf for much of the season, a scenario that forced Oakland manager Tony La Russa to manage under particularly tough circumstances. La Russa needed a solid season from his starting pitchers, and he got it from Dave Stewart, Storm Davis, Bob Welch, and the newly acquired Mike Moore. But it was a reacquisition that kept the A's going in the right direction, the June homecoming of Ricky Henderson. Henderson reached base in 80 of his 85 games with Oakland. And when the A's met Toronto in the league championship series, he aspired to even greater heights. Did he ever, with a league championship series record eight stolen bases in just five games, Ricky ruffled the Blue Jay pitchers to no end. He also hit two home runs in the series and scored or drove in 11 of the 26 total Oakland runs. Truly an MVP performance. But Jose also made a big impact. He hit a home run in game four that did everything but clear customs. An upper, upper deck blast that warbled the Blue Jays and surprised even Jose. And when the final bash had been recorded, the enterprising A's looked to Dennis Eckersley to seal it. And having weathered all the injuries, emerged once again as American League champions, intent now on claiming that which one year prior had so unexpectedly slipped away. The San Francisco Giants' road to the World Series was also a lesson in overcoming adversity as manager Roger Craig played mix and match with a patchwork pitching staff and somehow made it work. The Giants featured 15 different starting pitchers. And although Dave Dravecki provided inspiration with his dramatic comeback from cancer, unfortunately, he wasn't there for long. For a while, Kevin Mitchell carried the team single-handedly, finishing the season with a major league high 47 home runs and 125 RBIs. 
truly most valuable player type numbers. But Will Clark was the steady one, peeking out from behind his proverbial cape to hit 333 with 111 runs batted in. Clark felt especially at home in the league championship series against the Chicago Cubs, whose fans were pretty much surprised just to be there. Two home runs by Clark in game one alone, including a prodigious grand slam into the street, had the Giants fired up. After losing game two, it was home to Candlestick, where the Giants won nearly two of every three during the regular season. And it was Robbie Thompson in game three who powered the Giants to a come-from-behind victory. Next hero, Matt Williams, who also brought the Giants from behind in game four. San Francisco was a love fest, even if the fashion of the day did not include flowers in the hair. Don Zimmer's Cubs were in giant trouble, their backs against the wall. And when in the eighth inning of game five with the score tied, Clark came up with the bases loaded, it was the perfect setting for this genuine superstar. In the ninth, a 3-2 lead was saved by Steve Bedrosian, and the San Francisco Giants were National League champions. There was cause for celebration, but both the Giants and the A's knew the next one would be the sweetest one of all. The World Series began on the east side of San Francisco Bay, in Oakland, with no shortage of nicknames. The Bridge World Series, or should we call it the Bart World Series? BART is the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, the link between the two cities for those who choose not to use the Bay Bridge. And at every stop, fans from both cities expressed a tunnel vision view of their preferred baseball team. If nothing else, the series looked to set a record for mellowness. He doesn't know what team he's rooting for. He, Giants, You have to one. excuse him. But I love yeah. the A's, but I love no, the Giants. No, no, no. And my cat's an A's fan. Cross-rooting was everywhere, with everyone, it seemed, destined to win. Bottom line is, I'm a Bay Area person. If the A's win, go A's. The Giants win, that's my pick. Go Giants. With all the billing, no supplement was needed to baseball fever by the bay as the game got underway. Hitting third, first baseman number 22, Will Clark. Even the weather was cooperating in this baseball orgy of goodwill. On the mound for Oakland, the unflappable Dave Stewart with three straight 20 victory seasons to his credit. And for the Giants, Scott Gorelts, the one-time reliever turned starter, 14 and five on the year. The pop was over. It was time to let the circumstances take control. And the first hole to be dug came with Robbie Thompson at the plate and Stewart trying to settle in. One out, top of the first. Will Clark on deck. And Thompson is a little dribbler to the left of the mound. And Dave Stewart throws and throws past McGuire with a lot of room and foul territory. Phillips over to play it, and Thompson in at second. So the Giants get a break with Thompson now at second base, and that means with a man in scoring position, Stewart has to face Will Clark. And Clark goes after the first pitch, hits it to the gap in left center, but Dave Henderson moves over to make the catch. Thompson is late in tagging and has to hold at second. 
first Clark, then Mitchell, and an omen of things to come. Here's the one-two to Mitchell, hit to the right side, and short hop nicely by Phillips to throw him out. And the Giants are gone in the first. The heart of the Giants order had failed the first time around. And in the second, Gareltz was done in by the bottom of the A's order. For after Dave Henderson drew a walk, Terry Steinbach stood in. With runners then at first and second, the first run in the series was produced by hitter number eight. No batting, number two, Tony Phillips, second base. And he grounds it to the right side, and Clark was going back to first base. It goes through the hole for a base hit. Henderson scores one to nothing. With one run in and runners on the corners, Garrels looked like he might escape further damage, but then a giant mistake. One two pitch is hit slowly toward Clark. He's going to come home with it, and Kennedy drops it. Two nothing. The one thing you do when you're receiving a ball from the right side of the infield, if you're a catcher, is keep your weight on your left foot. Kennedy, with the weight on his right foot, allows Steinbeck to knock the foot away from the plate, thereby knocking the ball out of the glove. It should be an error on Terry Kennedy. The trouble with letting the bottom of the order get on base is that the top of the order isn't far behind, and Ricky Henderson made the Giants pay. The pitch is hit into right field for a base hit. Phillips is being waved in. Here comes the throw from Maldonado. It's offline, three to nothing. Weiss to third. Three runs in, and the A's had hardly flexed a muscle. But one inning later, the Cobra hit a bullseye. And he has a high drive to deep right field, and Dave Parker has hit his first World Series home run. In his 46th World Series at bat, Dave Parker, who had two in the playoffs, hits one out, and it's 4 nothing. He threw me two fastballs up and in for balls prior to throwing the, the fastball, which was a cut fastball in. But he got it down in, in bad location, and I hit it out. Almost every left-hand hitter, a low ball hitter, great hitting count, 2-0. and He just dropped ahead of the bat, right? And that ball was smoked. Parker's trademark home run trot had some folks just a little hot, but apologetic, he was not. When I think of it, I mean, my name is Dave Park, and basically people have made an issue of everything I've done in my career. Uh, but I've been doing the trot for about 10 years. Uh, I think in football, when they run a touchdown, they celebrate by some people dance, some people spike the ball. Uh, basically, uh, when you hit a home run, uh, you know, you got to trot. You know, that's, that's, that's the honor of hitting a home run. So I don't see anything to it. I'm not trying to show up anyone. I've been doing it for such a long time. Um, they should be unadapted to it by now. And, um, hey, I've hit 300 of them. I think I deserve the right. Then in the fourth inning, a man with some 300 fewer home run trots sent the Giants further reeling. And of all people, Rice drives one to right field and gone! Trailing 5-0 to this band of merry bashers, things looked especially bleak for the Giants, with Stewart simply getting stronger as the night got longer. Things were kind of just going, you know, they were hitting a lot of first pitch uh, outs for me. They were doing a lot of things early in the count. And for me, I didn't feel real challenged at that time. The challenge for me was to shut them down, not allow them to score a run. Finally in the ninth, San Francisco's third, as Clark and Mitchell began the inning with base hits. With fresh arms at the ready, LaRusa made the kind of trip that Stewart likes to see. When I turned around, I saw him run into the mound, which is not his procedure for taking a pitcher out of a ball game. I knew he wasn't going to take me out the game, and I was thinking, you know, this is going to be my chance. If I give up a run, then he's going to take me out. If, uh, I, if I get out, as long as I'm getting out, I get a chance to, to finish the game. So Stewart fanned Matt Williams. 
Then Ernest Riles, and Dave was thinking shutout. Now it's second and third with uh, two outs. So knowing that I had a chance to shut this club down, I wanted it badly. I go 3-1 to Candy Molinaro, and I'm thinking, don't give in. Um, find a way, and I threw a low sinker on the outside part of the plate. He had a ground ball for me, shut up. And it's grounded to third, backhanded by Phillips, straightens up, and Stewart has it shut up. And a memory worth savoring with a very special ball. The ball was one of the many ways that baseball tried to show how much it missed a friend. The series was dedicated to A. Bartlett Giamatti, and the former commissioner's family brought his spirit to the games, the games he loved so dearly. His son Marcus bravely lit the symbolic torch of the World Series by throwing out the first ball. And through the tears, a celebration arose heralding the life of a man who touched so many. The game had more than just an ardent fan in Giamatti, for he fully understood its place in the human spirit. He took joy in rubbing shoulders with his boyhood idols, and new heroes took joy in meeting him. The commissioner really had a good uh, understanding. We always laughed when we kid, and uh, we were always joking with one another. And, uh, I said, what's the A in A. Bartlett Giamatti? I said, nobody ever told us what the A stands for. I still don't know what that stands for. Angelo. Okay. Why didn't you say Angelo B. Giamatti? Because my mother and father made the judgment. But it's true, it would be a lot longer if I wrote Angelo Bartlett. They go right around. Is that, is that a lot easier? Oh, jeez. One incident happened in spring training. We were playing in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, playing Seattle, and he came out of the field doing batting practice one day, and he said, Rod, do you mind if I sit here? I said, sure, you can sit here. He said, why? I said, he said, well, it's sold out. I can't get a ticket. I said, wait a minute. You're the president of the league, and you can't get a ticket? Uh, this is when he was president of the National League. I said, well, come on. You sit beside me during the game. So as he sat there, I could see he was really getting involved, and he asked me a lot of questions about what I do, hit and run, squeeze plays. Just happened to be one of those type games where all these things came up, and he said, when are you going to hit and run? And I said, well, you tell me what pitch you want to do it on, and I'll do it. And every time he would say, do it, it worked, you know. And then on the squeeze play, about the seventh inning, he was, see, when he was starting to sweat, it almost like he was managing, you know. I said, Bart, you let me know when you want to squeeze. And he said, well, what about the opposition? I said, they don't know what you're doing here. So he said, why don't we do it on the two pitches from there? So it did, it worked, and he was ecstatic. And he, I never forgot that day. He was so... And every time I saw him, he'd tell me about it. So, Roger, when are you going you want me to help you manage again? Well, I think they'll remember that someone who was as talented as Bart, who was the president of Yale, decided to dedicate a significant portion of his life to baseball. And I think never again will baseball have to worry that it is not worthy of the very best talent there is in this country. And I think that will be one of the major legacies that Bart left behind. We won't see his kind for a long while. The A's were as loose as a World Series team could be heading into game two. Confident and for a change, healthy. Clark was looking to regain his playoff stroke for San Francisco. For where there's no will, there's no way. On the mound for the Giants, 17 game winner, Big Daddy Rick Russell, who dug his own first inning grave by walking the disruptive Henderson. With Ricky on first, everyone starts guessing, and often, they guess wrong. If I were Ricky, I wouldn't run until Russell throws a strike. A conservative lead for Henderson, but he's going. There's a strike, and Kennedy drops the ball. So much for the unpredictability of Ricky Henderson. And there are a few Oakland hitters more productive with runners on base than Carney Lansford. And now Lansford hits one down the line for a base hit and maybe more. Henderson comes in to score. Lanford with a double, one nothing Oakland. So for the second straight game, the Giants trailed early. But in the third, 19-game winner Mike Moore saw problems develop when, with a runner on first, and Jose Uribe at the plate, Moore got caught between gears. The chopper back to Moore. He has to double clutch to wait for Weiss to get the second, and that costs him a double play. 
The wheels then began to turn. A quick man on first and the equally quick Brett Butler at the plate. Do you steal? Do you run and hit? Hit and run? And if so, does the shortstop cover second? It's a word of mouth decision. Check out the open and closed mouth now. And you can figure out who will be covering. Open you, closed me. He's It'll covered. Be white. And a rebate goes, and it's hit to the hole for a base hit in the left field. And a classic example there of the shortstop trying to figure out who should be covering and guessing wrong. Right there, Weiss going towards the bag for some reason because Butler is a left field hitter. Bad decision by Walt Weiss. It also proved to be a costly decision. Moore's 1 2 to Thompson is hit in the air to deep right center field. Moving over is Henderson to make the catch. Tagging is Uribe, and the game is tied. That brought Clark to the plate with the go-ahead run at second. And now Moore began having trouble with his control of the split-finger fastball. You might say it was a novel situation for Steinbach as the wrath of the split-finger became evident. Two out, the 2-2 two -two to Clark is swung on and missed, but it bounces away from Steinbach, who has to throw him out at first, and he does. The run, of course, did not count because the third out was recorded at first, and thanks to Steinbach, the game remained tied 1-1. Still tied in the fourth, Russell walked Canseco and set up one of those situations that takes on such significance under the microscope that is the World Series. And Roger realized a bad matchup here, a low ball pitcher to a low ball hitter. And Parker eyeballs one to right field and into the corner, and it's a fair ball. Maldonado plays it perfectly. Big double clutches. Parker is in at second, but Canseco comes in to score. I'll tell you the one bad thing about a home run trot, sometimes you get into it prematurely. Parker could have been out at second base. The yellow line, of course, means fair ball in play. See, There's right the there. double double clutch by Maldonado, and still a strong throw. And Uribe makes the tag, but Dutch Renner says it's late. Very, very close. Following an out, Steinbach gave the A's still another matchup that Larusa had been looking forward to. You talk about your scouting reports. Tony LaRusso, when we had a chance to talk to him before the game, said, I feel that Steinbach's going to hit a home run off Russell. Again, you talk about matchups, low ball pitcher, low ball hitter. Just missed one the first time up. The deep left field, and LaRusso was very precious. God. I didn't find out till uh, after the press conference that night that Tony had made uh, that, that prediction. I consider myself to be more of a low ball hitter and uh, you know as Tony had mentioned before that game that was one of the reasons why he, he was uh, playing me that, that game and the pitch that I hit for the home run he got up about thigh high just up enough where I could get a little bit more extension on it and as soon as I hit that ball I, I knew for sure it was a home run. With a 5-1 to one lead the A's were turning this into a replay of game one and Moore was sailing along. Having given up just three hits on the night, Moore bid the fans adieu at the end of the seventh inning. For when you've got a bullpen that's as sweet as Oakland's, you milk it for all you've got. And with the defense of a Tony Phillips, the cream was rising to the top. Phillips' heroics paved the way for one who's very accustomed to the role. And Eckersley in the ninth is something no opposing manager likes to see. The reason's as simple as one, two, three. The A's had methodically disposed of the Giants in two straight. If they looked like supermen coming into the series, they now look like they should be wearing capes.
but the bottom line was simple and a pitcher's manager understood. Well, they had two great pitching performances against us. You know, uh, Stewart pitched a great ball game, and I thought he had an excellent split thing to go along with his 92-mile-an-hour fastball, and then Mike Moore comes along, and, and at th that day, had a, the second game, even had a better one than Stewart. So we're back home now. We played well here. We've had the best record in the National League at home. Our fans are very loud, uh, boisterous. When we're introduced, it can be so loud, it can be unreal. Yes, a flame still burned at Candlestick. This is what it's all about at Candlestick. Right here, buddy! Giants! Giants! No, Giants are going to crush the ball. Right there! Oh, Kevin! Yeah. Giants! Oh, you can't say that. Edit that out. 63,000 fans that support a team that show Oakland what baseball is about. Right, guys? Yeah. All right, welcome to Candlestick Park, guys. <laughs> By game day, the excitement had escalated for the first World Series game at Candlestick since 1962. The fans were confident their Giants could erase the two-game deficit, and that Will Clark would find the bat with all those playoff hits. Everything was in the normal pregame mode at Candlestick. There was no warning, no precursor of that which was to come. Time in Our ABC broadcast began at 5 o'clock Pacific time. Four minutes into it, we were showing the nation a replay from a previous game. Then the earth began to move. Allowing Jose Canseco to score, and he fails get Dave Parker at second base, so the Oakland A's take... take I'll tell you what, we're having an earth... Quake was the word that never made it on the air. in just a moment. Obviously, we were shaken by the turn of events, but a moment later, a festive air seemed to permeate the crowd as if to say, look at us, we made it. The gods are on our side. They are, they are. I believe it. We're going to win now. Can't go wrong with an earthquake in San Francisco. Hey, uh, somebody's trying to shake us up. All right, Lord, I heard you. Players from both teams compared earthquake stories, and some in the crowd began to wonder just when the game would be resumed. Your attention, please. Power has been interrupted temporarily in the park. We're working at trying to restore it now. We ask your cooperation by remaining in your seats. First time I ever got scared in Calvary. I got knocked down a lot, but this is the first time I ever got scared. Then we saw the pipes inside here shut. Then the lights and the TV went off. We knew something was wrong. After all, we're in California. The famous one of all time was here in 1906. So we know what's happening. But then reports began to trickle in, and a subtle transformation took place. 6.9. 6.9. That's the major Bay Bridge collapsed. 20 feet of the bridge went in the water. The Bay Bridge, the very symbol of this series. Not in the water, thank heavens, but bad enough. Fans soon learned of a major fire in the Marina District. And then the horribly tragic collapse of the 880 freeway. Images seen, ironically, from the very blimp that minutes prior was intent on capturing the beauty by the bay. What generally happens is when there's one earthquake, there's a possibility of an aftershock. It can be smaller, it can be larger. Um, that happens 
you know, anywhere up with, within 24 hours. Ladies and gentlemen, we're, we are postponing the game because there is no power in the stadium. We would like you to leave in an orderly way. I don't believe there's any great danger, but we have no idea when the power is going to be on, and we have to get people out of here before it gets dark. We're back here in the production truck, and it's it's a uh, it's funny. I think everybody at, at first oohed and odd and and didn't quite know what had happened. You get the sense that people are almost more nervous now, as the reality of what has taken place begins to sink in. At first, uh, you knew you were a part of something historic, uh, sitting through an earthquake in a ballpark preparatory to a World Series game, and now, of course, uh, just in walking out in the last few minutes. Uh, Everybody is exhaling. Oh, that was about, about the big shake. The cement floor <laughs> the went The big up shake and of the quake. Yeah, the cement floor went, the lights went. Lights swayed. Woo! And I thought it was party time. We thought it was all over. But no one at Candlestick was more frightened than Benjamin Young, the worker who found himself high atop the light stanchion when the pole began to sway. What did that feel like down here? God, that whole thing was going like this. I fell down to my knees like I'm holding on. Oh, man. No one was injured at Candlestick, and fans filed out in a peaceful fashion, thinking now about what might have been. I just think it's really ironic that this is the Bay Bridge series. The Bay Bridge did collapse. I just think it's kind of interesting how the whole thing worked out. A moment in time, on the day the Earth did not stand still, it took just 15 seconds to change so very many lives. Early estimates of casualties were high, but everything was out of kilter. Baseball recognized the problem and responded accordingly. It is becoming very clear to all of us in Major League Baseball that our concerns, despite this rather large gathering, our issue is really uh, a modest one in light of the great tragedy that's hit this area. We are not going to be able to play baseball in either of these communities before next Tuesday. But even that proved optimistic. More time was needed, and Vincent once again postponed the games. I'd like to announce that we are going to play a candlestick starting Friday night Saturday and Sunday, and we will go to Oakland if necessary, Tuesday and Wednesday. That schedule is now set. The great attraction of all this, I might say to you from baseball's point of view, is that we have the comfort of knowing that the community is, is pleased with our resuming baseball. I said to you I thought it was important for baseball to know its place. I think we have found the right place. It turned out to be a full 10 days before the series resumed. The consensus was that playing on would help the healing and help lift the spirits close to where they were before the ground began to sway. I think that the World Series is going to change things and people are just going to start being normal again because the World Series is going to bring us all back together. When the crowd breaks into singing San Francisco, it's going to be wonderful because that's what it's all about. This is going to be our game, num game number three. They've got all the fans starts. that have come back. They've, we've sat through a quake, and we're back here for more. This place will be rocking in there. Yeah. yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> Inside Candlestick, the familiar sights and sounds of baseball. Signs of recovery were everywhere, along with a few hard hats, reminding the world that San Franciscans ride their earthquakes like sailors ride the sea. The teams, too, were relieved to be playing, but as game time approached, everyone took a moment to reflect. Ten days ago at this time, as we prepared for Game 3 of the World Series here at Candlestick Park, a major earthquake shook Northern California. Please join together now to observe a moment of silence in memory of those who perished in this disaster. Thank you. Friends, neighbors, and strangers join hands as one, first alone, 
Then together, a display of goodwill through action and song. After 10 days, the fans got to see their pennant raised and cheer the team they love. And now for the National League champion, San Francisco Giants. It almost seemed like therapy, a catharsis of sorts. Fans wildly cheering their Giants and taking what amounted to a three-hour rest from the images of the past 10 days. But knowing now how the Earth could move, new ground rules were in order. We get a situation where we have a tremor. Whatever happens, happens. Everything's in play. Everything's in play. The ball's not dead when the tremor occurs. Right. In other words, it keeps on going until the play like, is over. It's just like a bad hop. You got it? It's like a ground ball bad hop. That's, the lights go out. The, book that's, the, light, the lights go out. We got that covered by the book. Okay, we're finally going to do it. It's going to go. We waited long enough, haven't we? Right, good. good luck, guys. And before the first real pitch to bring back October's heroes, the real-life heroes of the earthquake were called on to symbolize the spirit and compassion of these people by the bay. Game one starting pitchers were back on the mound. Stewart for the A's, the Relts for the Giants. And if there was any question as to whether the intensity of the series could be regained, it was answered in the first inning with one pitch. And again, it's up and in. 2-0, and, oh, and Panseco, after taking two pitches inside, and of all things, Jose begins to go toward the mound. Some of the players exit the dugout, but it will stop right there. That's just misdirected passion right there. I mean, there's no way that Scott Gorelz is throwing at Canseco. That is very close, however. And the book on Canseco is you've got to pitch him inside. So the spirit of unbound love in this region, which had even extended to these two teams, at least as far as the teams are concerned, lasts about three minutes. Breaking pitch into the hole, and that's a base hit. Lansford will stop at second as Mitchell gets it back in. LaRusa then played it aggressively, and with McGuire at bat, sent both runners to stay out of the double play. The strategy worked perfectly, and the tone the A's had established before the quake had been reclaimed without missing a beat. Two on, two out, and Dave Henderson, who is all for six in the World Series and hasn't hit the ball out of the infield, takes away ball one. I go for six a lot. I mean, it wasn't any big deal for me or, or Conseco. Um, we as hitters, we know we're going to make outs. Uh, we know we're going to get hits. And uh, people just get excited when we don't get hits. And, you know, they call it a slump. I call it 0 for 6. <laughs> now, Garrels with first base open, naturally can afford to be more careful with Henderson here. In the air to right field and deep. And Sheridan goes back. And it's off the top of the fence. And in play, in play, two runs will score, and Henderson has a double. Dave saying, wasn't it a home run? That was the hardest ball I hit. I mean, uh, you know, I've hit a few home runs in my career, and I usually know when they're out of the ballpark, and that ball should have went out of the park. It was only the top of the first, and the Giants, who had never had a lead in the series, found themselves down once again. Trailing 2 0 and with Stewart on the mound, things did not look good for the Giants until the third when Stewart faced the youngest player in the series, 23 year old Matt Williams. That's driven to deep left field, and Matt Williams has hit it out. So the Giants pick up their second run of the World Series, their first home run. And the score 
Tigers two to one. And just their second run in more than 20 innings was cause for giant fans to celebrate. But a home run derby with Oakland is a no win proposition and one inning later Henderson who had already hit one off the top of the fence went the extra yard. There's a drive to deep right center field and that one is gone. Dave Henderson this time hits it over. Henderson had given Oakland a three to one lead and before he had even received his share of bashes in the dugout an encore by the A's Mr. Versatility Tony Phillips. With just four home runs during the regular season Phillips had given the A's a four to one lead and sent the shell shocked Geralts to the bunker with World Series memories he'd like to forget. The Giants though weren't quite ready to roll over and die and in the bottom of the fourth made their first legitimate threat in the series with Clark the catalyst. Clark lines it in the center field for a base hit. So with one out a single by Clark here in the fourth inning and the crowd comes very much alive again as Kevin Mitchell comes to the plate. And when Stewart walked Ken Oberfeld to load the bases with one out, Candlestick had grand visions of a slam. And Matt Williams entered the picture as just the man to do it. But Stewart froze Williams with a fastball on the corner. And that left it up to an ice cold Terry Kennedy and the fans were now ready to settle for any old base hit. And it's lined in the center field for a base hit. Clark comes in to score. Here comes Mitchell. The throw is cut off. It's 4-3. Kennedy's hit had the A's in a temporary stew and put the Giants in a position to tie. But it's at times like this that the vaunted Oakland defense makes its mark. And the 2-2 pitch is grounded to the right side. Great diving stop by McGuire, but the throw was hit. McGuire making that defensive play, which was a very tough one against a good runner, Sheridan, and Stewart getting over the cover was, I mean, that's classic defensive baseball. And we walk back in our dugouts, fill up a run. And uh, any time that you've got the edge and keep it, and if they come at you like they did, but you, you, know, you don't give up the lead, it's always a big plus for your team. They have some momentum, but not all of it. So uh, I, I really felt the defensive play kept the momentum on our side. And it stayed there in the fifth as Henderson stole his 11th base of the postseason, a new record, and third in three World Series games. And after Kelly Downs walked Lansford, Jose Canseco brought the resurrected Giants back to earth. Drops down and it's drilled a deep left center field and Jose Canseco on a 2-2 pitch has hit it out. One out later, an encore from Dave Henderson. And in the sixth, it was Lansford with the fifth home run of the game for the A's, tying the record set by the 1928 Yankees. More importantly for Oakland, it meant a 9-3 lead over the downcast Giants after six innings. Stewart headed for the clubhouse with MVP credentials trailing in his wake. 
The A's, meanwhile, kept on rolling, forging a 10-run lead. And the Giants were down to their last gasp in the ninth. Let's go, Giants! Come on, Giants. Despair turned to a glimmer of hope when pinch hitter Bill Baith came up with two men on. There's a high drive to deep left field. Tony Phillips goes all the way back, and that one is gone. Get out of town! It ain't no move! Yeah! And if you have stayed with us, you have just watched a little bit of World Series history. Seven home runs in a game. First World Series at bat. For Bill Bates, a three-run homer. With one swing, Bates became the Giants series RBI leader. But then, perhaps symbolically, a bank of lights went out at Candlestick, and fans, prepared for anything these days, lit their home-brought flashlights in a gesture of faith. Looks like the backdrop for Twinkle Twinkle Little Star here. What Roger's looking for, though, right now, is the light at the end of this tunnel. Instead, all he saw was Todd Burns, who, after giving up another run, faced a showdown with Mitchell. One and two on Mitchell. Breaking pitch, lifted to left field, but right toward Phillips, who has to back up, and that's it. So the Giants in the ninth send nine to the plate, get four, but come up well short, and the A's are one victory away from their first world championship in 15 years. Three for the money, one more for the show. Up to now, the numbers simply hadn't added up for the Giants. And to come back from a three games to nothing World Series deficit, well, let's say they had more of a fighting chance to keep history intact. The Giants will not go down in four. The Giants will be back. 3-0 behind, well, never been done before in history, but I think today's the day. I really feel a turnaround coming on. Willie May stood tall in throwing out the first ball for game four, which he promptly gave to the fans. But Willie's presence did inspire some to say, hey, we've still got a shot at this. That's it. Willie, that's what we needed. Willie. We're bringing Willie back. The official lineup change. The official lineup change had Don Robinson with less than two innings pitched in postseason play on the mound for the Giants in this most crucial game. His first mission, as is the case when you face Oakland, would be to take the voodoo out of Ricky Henderson's bat. But that was one ritual Giant pitchers hadn't mastered, and their fans were all but resigned to the inevitable. Well, Robinson did keep Ricky off the base paths, but not in the way he had planned. Henderson had set a record by becoming the eighth different Oakland A to homer in the series, and the one nothing lead had Craig talking to himself. With Dave Henderson on third, the Giants intentionally walked light-hitting Walt Weiss, simply because there was no way the next hitter could hurt them. Pitcher Mike Moore with one lifetime at bat. Oh, for one career. How about that? Yeah. You doubt that Robinson has a scouting report on Moore, don't you? Has trouble with a thrown ball. And it's hit in the air to center field, and Butler races back, and it's over his head. Henderson comes in to score. Weiss is being waved in. He scores on the first hit by an American League pitcher since 1979 in a World Series game. When something happens once in a decade, you should always take the ball out of play. But Moore had little time to savor his double because it was time to think about base running. And that's grounded to the hole for a base hit. Moore is being waved in by Laxman. Here comes Kevin Mitchell's throw to Kennedy. Not in time. Down a second goes Henderson, and it's four to nothing. And Roger Craig has to go to the mound in the second inning. Everything was going perfectly for Mike Moore offensively. And defensively, things were going every bit as well. And when it was needed, 
The more or less unsung hero of the series, the Oakland defense rose to the occasion. I would hope that the story of the Oakland A's defense in the 1989 World Series gets all the attention it should because that's a remarkable defensive performance when you look at the plays that were made and especially you talk about the inactivity that was forced upon them. For Stu to throw that first ball away and there not be another error, um, I think it's one of, gotta be one of the greatest defensive performances in World Series history. Now, I may exaggerate a little bit, but I think so. There's no better combination than that sort of defense and a potent offense. And leading by four, the A's began to pull away. With Canseco on second, and Dave Henderson having drawn a walk at first base, Terry Steinbach went the other way. That's hit down the line in right field, and it's a base hit, and more. As Canseco comes in to score, Henderson rounds third. He comes in to score. The relay to third is not in time there, and it is six to nothing on a triple by Steinbach. And up by six, it was time for A's fans to dust off some symbolic gestures. The A's had increased their lead to 8 0 in the sixth when Will Clark responded with a two out single in the bottom of the sixth. And Giant fans pinned their plaintive comeback hopes on the long ball capability of Kevin Mitchell. There was still a long, long way to go, but it appeared at least as if the Giants had succeeded in knocking Moore out of the game. The truth was, more or less, a cramp in style. The reason was that he had started to get some back spasms that he started feeling in the fifth inning. And only after a lot of checking with Barry Weinberg did he go out there for the sixth. And if you remember the sixth, he got the first two hitters out. The guy got on base and he got a ball up to Mitchell. It's a two-run homer. So in looking at his discomfort in his back and the possibility that he might blow out and hurt himself and also may not be as effective. The reason he was removed was his, you know, the, the problems with his back. It wasn't because uh, I necessarily thought that he'd had enough and wanted to go to my bullpen. But the Giants had a foothold, and after Kennedy walked to lead off the seventh against reliever Gene Nelson, rookie Greg Litton came up and displayed a veteran stroke. That's hit to deep left field. For the first time in the series, Candlestick was in a state of bedlam. And now against Rick Honeycutt, Candy Maldonado kept the pressure on. That's hit in the air to right field and deep. Canseco going back, all the way back. That's off the fence, off his back, at his feet. Maldonado rounding second, on his way to third, in with a triple. Brett Butler liked the sounds he was hearing and sought to keep the fans going. to six and the redoubtable Will Clark was at the plate. The stage was set for a miraculous comeback. Will Clark is the tying run and it's hit high in the air to shallow right field. And Seiko comes in underneath it and makes the catch staying with it. Staggering for the moment under him. Clark just getting under him. Two down and Kevin Mitchell is the bat. No question here that a change will be made. Tony again!
Giants come that close to tying it. But every Giants rally had an Oakland answer, and even though the A's scored one off Steve Bedrosian in the eighth, neither the fans nor the Giants were about to give in. Bases loaded, two down, eighth inning, nine to six, A's. And that's popped up in foul territory, and it might be playable. Going to be real close for Clark, and he makes the catch. I believe he does. Clark's going to come over to make sure. Yes. That's all you'll ever need to know about Will Clark. Ever. Folks, I don't know what to tell you to look at first. Here's a fabulous catch, and you talk about the high rent district. Look at the company Clark is going to keep here. He winds up nearly in the lap of the commissioner, Faye Vincent, right there. Mr. Commissioner, what do you think? Is it a catch or no catch? I'll tell you what Commissioner Benson is thinking. All of these decisions over the past two weeks have been dropped in my lap, but now Will Clark. <laughs> but now the lap of luxury belonged to Oakland, and behind Eckersley and its dauntless defense, the A's took a giant step. So here we go in the bottom of the ninth inning with Nixon to lead off. And tries to bunt his way on, and it's a good bunt to the right side, and Phillips shovels, gets him! So the A's continue to do it in every phase. Power, hitting, running, defense, pitching, of course. Fly ball to left field. Henderson makes the catch. And the Giants are now down to their final out. Methodical and poised. This year, it was the Oakland A's who would emerge as baseball's artful Dodgers. A's trying to sweep. But the Giants have certainly not made life easy for them tonight. It's a ground ball to the right side. Steered by Phillips. With their four-game sweep and their unwavering focus through the turmoil, the A's inspired comparison to baseball's greatest teams. I think we probably won the most historic World Series of all time, and I think our players probably deserve more credit, and so do the Giants for going through this. You know, they have to deal with the delay and the emotional tugs and still come out and play competitive baseball. I don't know anybody's had to do more than that as a, as a baseball team to win, win a World Championship or compete for the World Championship like the Giants did. So. I feel great about it. But in this most cherished of baseball's moments, the celebration was muted. Bittersweet reflection filled the locker room. For this was a series when baseball and real life were intrinsically entwined as never before. And long after it was over, the echoes of the earthquake lingered on. You look at the, uh, the whole thing, and when you talk about the 89 World Series, it's not going to be who was MVP or even who won the World Series, but the, the heroes that were involved in the Buck Helms who survived, the volunteers that were so gracious in helping out through the tragedies that have happened, uh, the collapse of 880 and the, and, and the Bay Bridge itself, and that's where the focus is going to be. Baseball will be secondary exactly where it should be. I think the city, um, you know, during a period of time that I was visiting the Cypress site and going around and talking to people within the city, Everybody felt pretty much the same sentiment, and that was when the series does resume, uh, we want you guys to win it, and um, that's what we're here for.
<laughs> Relive the moments. Major League Baseball home video.